Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. A major step in combating the nationwide opioid crisis. A panel of experts at the Food and Drug Administration is recommending that Narcan, a nasal spray used to reverse opioid overdoses, be sold over the counter without a prescription. Public health experts have long said a move like this could be critical to ending the opioid overdoses that have killed more than 100,000 Americans in the last Last year and just shy of 3,000 in New Jersey alone. The Murphy administration recently announced a statewide program that will make Narcan available for free and anonymously at participating pharmacies. A spokesperson says if approved, a federal program would add to the initiative here, where nearly 150 pharmacies have already agreed to participate. If the FDA gives the green light, Narcan could potentially be available in vending machines, supermarkets, and even big box stores by this summer. For more, I'm joined by Dr. Lewis Nelson, an expert in overdose and addiction management and chair of emergency medicine at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. Dr. Nelson, this is perhaps one of the strongest moves we've seen from the government to combat this rise in opioid overdose deaths. What's your reaction to this recommendation? This is very good news. You know, making the drug naloxone accessible and in the hands of people who are at the scene of an event, an overdose event, uh, is going to change the entire way that the events are handled. We're going to be able to respond quickly and easily. We're not going to have to go look for naloxone. People are going to be able to have it on their person when they need it. How does this differ, though, from what uh, New Jersey recently announced, though not yet um, in effect, where folks can anonymously, without a prescription, um, obtain this drug? What's different about this method? Well, it's not totally clear how it's going to work. So one of the questions is that the, because the drug will be federally available on a non-prescription basis, it will be not just New Jersey that's affected, but it'll be the entire country. It, the, one of the things I'm not clear about, which clearly nobody knows yet, is whether this will be over the counter, meaning stocked on the shelves, or behind the counter, meaning you have to ask the pharmacist for it or locked in a plexiglass cage like razor blades are and things like that. If it shows up on the shelf like uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen does, you'll be able to walk and pick it up, no questions asked. If you have to ask a pharmacist like you currently do, there will be an extra step. But, it, you know, again, it's, un it's unclear how that's going to work out. The other advantage of having something over the counter, uh, and because there are now generics available, means the price should come down. Uh, it's still not free. Uh, in many places. So there's going to be a cost associated with it, but the cost of over-the-counter non-prescription um, and generic medications is typically lower. Well, and certainly with a drug like this, where it can take a few doses to reverse uh, an overdose, um, that cost will be uh, crucial. Um, I'm wondering, though, if you have any concerns about if it does end up behind the counter. We know that there's stigma um, involved with all of this, but particularly with folks, um, you know, who want to ask to have this medication on hand. Well, that's what it's like now. You know, it, it's just one step better than having to have a prescription and go in and use your insurance or pay out in, you know, cash or credit card uh, a large amount of money that most people don't have. You know, this is a drug that's often needed by people who don't have the means to afford it. So the lower the price and the more accessible, the better off will be. Uh, will it remove stigma completely? No, of course not but it will definitely take the edge off of the current process in order to get the drug. Given what we've seen, doctor, with the spike, with the prevalence of fentanyl, is it something that you'd recommend families have on hand uh, once it becomes available, like acetaminophen, like ibuprofen? 
You never know who uses opioids. The more accessible it is, the better off we are. You will not be able to run to a pharmacy and get it in time in most cases. You have to have it on you or, or somewhere nearby. Dr. Lewis Nelson for us, uh, thanks so much. My pleasure, anytime. Expanded access to naloxone is one of the factors experts say led to New Jersey's first year-over-year -year decrease in fatal drug overdoses in this last decade. But those improvements aren't the same across the board. As Melissa Rose Cooper reports, there are still spikes happening in vulnerable communities. Drug addiction continues to be a huge problem in New Jersey, but there are signs the crisis could be improving as the state recorded its first year-over-year -year decline in drug overdose deaths in a decade. It's great news. It's something that we really want to celebrate community response. A recent report from the chief state medical examiner shows just under 2,900 people died in 2022 from suspected drug use. That's down from roughly 3,100 the prior year. Caitlin O'Neill, co-director at New Jersey Harm Reduction Coalition, credits the drop to an increased availability of naloxone, which is used to reverse the effects of opioids. People knowing that they can safely legally carry and use naloxone. Um, and so a lot of that is due in part to the many amazing organizations throughout the state who distribute naloxone, who train on naloxone, and um, also to the bills that were passed last year, making that naloxone access steady and um, legal for everyone. But while overall drug-related deaths are down in the Garden State, they're still increasing in Black communities as well as among senior residents. According to the medical examiner's office, fatal overdoses among Black New Jerseyans were up 28 percent between 2021 and 2022. And for residents 55 and older, it increased by 31 percent. We have a, a very strong historical legacy across the country of disparities in access to drug abuse treatment. And that has existed in New Jersey. It exists pretty much across the country. Uh, and and uh, uh, that is definitely a contributing factor. The thing that mostly impacts situations like this is um, stigma and um, the accessibility of individuals to naloxone or um, accessibility for education in those two communities. So they would know what to do in case of a drug overdose or um, even the education on the usage of opioids. Which Leslie Harrison says can be even more difficult for seniors to get since many of them are also dealing with changes to their body as they get older. The eyesight, um, understanding um, medication regimens, and they sometimes have so many medications to take, the addition of one more uh, makes it difficult for them. Um, their eating habits and exercise, these both play an uh, important part on the, how the opioid is um, used and distributed in their bodies. Advocates also say there are a number of other drugs available that can be used instead of opioids, so having more access to resources in all communities will give residents the ability to ask the right questions when it comes to their care and ultimately save more lives. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. The death toll from the earthquakes that rocked Syria and Turkey more than a week ago now stands at more than 40,000. In Turkey, volunteers and relief aid have been flowing in since almost immediately after the disaster struck. But in Syria, the earthquake worsened an already dire humanitarian crisis. Help is scarce and resources are even fewer due to the decade-long civil war there. The World Health Organization says the zone of greatest concern is northwestern Syria as anger grows over the slow delivery of humanitarian help. Those who desperately need it now face new threats to their survival. Well, joining me now is Mohammed Karula, Syrian American and mayor of Prospect Park. Mayor, I just want to get a sense from you about what you're hearing on the ground and what's most needed right now. Thank you very much, Brianna. The reality on the ground is there is uh, 172,000 Syrians who have been displaced in the northwestern part of Syria that is outside the control of the regime. 
35,000 of those people, which equate to about 7,100 families, have been placed in about 172 temporary shelter centers. Uh, so far, only 114 trucks have entered the northwestern part of, of Syria. Um, more aid is actually going to the regime controlled areas, which has only about 12% of the damage in Syria. Uh, so the need is very dire. Um, I urge my fellow New Jerseyans to right now either uh, donate through um, items that are being uh, collected at certain centers. And we have a donation coming up in Montville this Saturday and in Patterson on Sunday, or donate to organizations, reputable organizations that have operations on the ground inside Syria, that have Syrian affiliations, and that have been authorized by the US government to give donations to, because then they could buy whatever is there locally uh, to help uh, the people. Yeah, uh, there's there's been misinformation for sure about humanitarian aid that's not part of the sanctions. Is there a sense, though, Mayor, um, that the international community has failed Syria? Uh, only about 5 percent of the area devastated has actually been searched. The search for survivors is over. Is there a sense that the community has been failed? Absolutely, 100 percent. If you look at inside uh, Syria, which is the area is not serviced by the regime, 75 percent of the aid that's arriving there right now is either through local efforts or from the country of Turkey. The, the United Nations and the international community has delivered 25 percent of the aid, which, as I mentioned earlier, is coming in, in small drops. Uh, many of the border crossings are not still being utilized, uh, which is resulting in hundreds of thousands of people who are not being serviced. Um, so, yes, the international community should be acting quickly because right now we are not in a rescue mode anymore, but there are still a lot of people who don't have homes, who don't have medical care, and who just are suffering in this cold weather. Mayor Mohammed Karula of Prospect Park, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Individuals with disabilities say they're being forced to make a heart-crushing choice, get married or keep their vital benefits. Couples recently marked the Valentine's holiday by holding an unofficial commitment ceremony, drawing attention to what's at risk for them if they opt to walk down the aisle. Ted Goldberg has the story. Couples here in Montclair got dressed up, exchanged vows, but stopped just short of getting legally married. By the powers invested in me, by me, Patrice Jetter, I pronounce you all together. For longtime partners like Matthew Arnold and Diana Stolfo, we met since we were like infants. Marriage isn't happening anytime soon. No, we're not married. We just had a kind of family. Last June, June 25th. How was that? It was beautiful, very elegant. Couples with disabilities risk a lot if they decide to get married. We live in apartments. And that's not all. Supplemental security income to Medicaid, to housing. To the, there's a lot of potential services and supports that folks with disabilities need that could be jeopardized if they get married. Paul Aronson works for the state, advocating for people with disabilities and their families. The asset limit for somebody is $2,000 for an individual, but if there was a married couple, it's $3,000. So they get penalized. They can't even double the amount of resources that they have in the bank account. I don't think that was intentional, but I think it's, it's long past time that we fix it. That would be a dream. I would lo love to see that happening. I do care because I'm advocating for it, but it's just, it feels like that is taken away from us and it should be for us. Matt and Diana were just one of the couples at Montclair State joining in a commitment ceremony officiated by Patrice Jetter. She has cerebral palsy and has become an advocate for people with disabilities. I would see people coming out of church at weddings, um, their family there, Everybody is all happy and looking beautiful, and I didn't understand how come that couldn't be me. Jetter, like other advocates, calls this the marriage penalty. 
She's optimistic that lawmakers will fix it if more people start to back the cause. There's actually more of us now, and in order for things to change, we're gonna have to be the change to do that. There's a bill in Washington that would get rid of the marriage penalty for SSI benefits, and it's co-sponsored by both of New Jersey senators. Jetter thinks it can pass. If it does, you might be able to credit her persistence. We're not going to go away. I know I'm not going to go away. They're going to eventually do something because they're going to get sick of seeing me. And this is why we can't give up. E even though sometimes you feel like it, you got to keep going. We talk about marriage equality all the time. You know, this is an opportunity here to sort of fix something that, again, I think was inadvertent, but something that has prevented couples like Diana and Matt from getting married. And that's just not right. And I think we, I think we can come together. I think, this, I think people of goodwill will come together and fix this. And make it easier for people with disabilities to get married and reap the full benefits of all that comes with saying, I do. In Montclair, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. Meanwhile, state lawmakers today took action on another piece of marriage equality, approving a bill codifying a person's right to marry or enter into a civil union with someone of any race. It comes amid concerns the U.S. Supreme Court could overturn the interracial marriage right established some 56 years ago after the court's Dobbs decision last summer overturning abortion rights and left the door open to similar challenges. Well, bill sponsor Assemblyman John McKeon argued the state needs to take a similar stance on interracial marriage as it did to enshrine reproductive rights and access to contraception. Critics, meanwhile, said the legislation is raising an issue where one doesn't yet exist. But the Judiciary Committee did unanimously approve the bill today. It goes on for a full vote in the Assembly. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, the legislature also finally took up one of the most debated questions in our state's history, whether Central Jersey exists. It does, and some lawmakers want to give a boost to tourism there, along with two other prized industries, historical sites and agribusiness. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas is at the State House with the latest. Joanna. Brianna, a package of four bills aimed at improving New Jersey's tourism industry moved easily through two assembly committees today, the Tourism, Gaming and the Arts Committee and the Agriculture and Food Security Committee. The bills would invest more money into the state's tourism advertising efforts and would create more regional coordination so that some of the tourism wealth would go to locations other than the shore. This is going to allocate $2.5 million to agritourism. And what's nutty about it is that we've never done this before and we are the garden state. Let's celebrate, let's promote our agricultural heritage. And when we do that, we lift up local economies. The idea behind one bill, promoting the state's agritourism industry, think apple and pumpkin picking or visiting one of the state's wineries or breweries. The bill would help regions and individual locations advertise to get folks to visit more establishments during those outings. When they come to a community to go apple picking, it's where can I have dinner? Where can I have lunch? Uh, what other activities can I take my kids to? It is doing those trails and, and going from one farm to another farm to another farm. And then, OK, where can we stay overnight? One bill very bravely and perhaps for the first time takes on the age old question, is there a central Jersey? By the way, the answer is yes to that question, just so we're clear about this. The bill would shift from six tourism zones to simply north, central and south. And then within those, let's have the flexibility for those regions to then further divide. Because we know, for example, North Jersey, closer to the city, it's, it's metropolitan. And then going out west, they have skiing. And the same thing holds true in all the other regions. There are different flavors associated with it. Another of the bills passed includes a roadside signage program so drivers on state roads can more easily see nearby historic sites, an important effort as the nation prepares to celebrate its 250th anniversary. Getting attention to some of New Jersey's historical sites, which may go overlooked by a lot of people even in New Jersey. The idea is that tourists spend dollars when they visit New Jersey or stay in New Jersey. That, that can be staying in our hotels and motels, visiting our restaurants, but they also buy gas here and pay tolls here and other items that are subject to state taxation. 
at all generates economic development for the state. This is about New Jersey's economy. This is about making sure that we are taking full advantage of the amazing state that we live in. The bill package received support from several of the state's commerce and business associations. Our tourism economy has not recovered from the pandemic fully, and, and we have pockets of the state where the jobs aren't there, the wages benefits aren't there the way we all want, um, and, and these bills will help better plan for their, the growth of the economic um, the economy and tourism. These bills will better support that industry. The bills still have a long way to go, but the goal for the folks in the room today was to get some of these advertising systems in place now before bigger events like the World Cup coming to New Jersey in 2026. In Trenton, I'm Joanna Gagas. Back to you, Bree. All right, thanks, Joe. Well, one industry that seems to be doing just fine in New Jersey is gambling. Preliminary numbers from the Division of Gaming Enforcement show that legal bets on this past Sunday's Super Bowl topped $109 million. Now, those were placed at sports books run by casinos, at racetracks, and on mobile apps. It's down a bit from last year's $117 million in wagers on the big game. But casinos in the U.S. are reporting their best year in history, bringing in more than $60 billion in 2022. The majority of that coming from in-person gambling, and Atlantic City posted the second highest in-person betting numbers after Vegas, raking in nearly $3 billion in 2022. That's up about 8.5% from a year ago. It's all from table games, slots, and sports bets placed in person. It comes, though, as problem gambling is on the rise. The state recently announced it will require casinos to proactively identify and offer help to gamblers who may be at risk for addiction. Turning now to Wall Street, here's a look at how the markets close today. A reminder to catch NJ Business Beat this weekend with Rhonda Schaffler and parents of young kids will want to watch for a look at the cost of education from kindergarten through college. Then she dives into newly proposed rules to rein in spending at higher ed institutions, plus the impact of charter school expansion on our state. Watch it Saturday morning at 10 a.m. streaming on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. It's looking more and more like a vessel strike is to blame for the most recent whale that washed up on the Jersey Shore in Manasquan earlier this week. A representative from NOAA said in a statement, initial tests indicate the 35-foot humpback whale was struck by a boat or a ship, which supports what the federal agencies suspected as the reason behind a series of dead whales washing up in the region recently. Since December 1st, six dead humpback whales have been reported in New Jersey, three others in New York. Federal officials say a tenth was reported floating off the shores in January, but it hasn't been seen since then. Some environmental groups, Republican lawmakers, and even local officials have been calling for offshore wind development to stop until it's determined whether the work has a role in the whale deaths. So far, though, federal and state officials say there's no evidence linking the two. And a final cause of this latest whale death, if one can be found, could take weeks or even months. Before we leave you tonight, we want to remind you about our latest digital project. It's called Water's Edge, the Trials and Tributaries of the Delaware River Watershed. It's a multi-part series examining the troubled history of the Delaware River's transformation from a polluted body of water full of sewage and chemical waste to a recreational destination for the region. The cleanup work, though, is far from over and now new threats loom. Problems caused by development, climate change and rapid urbanization. They're all threatening the watershed, which supports the river and provides a water system to more than 10 million people. Our digital reporters explored the Delaware River Basin to bring you to four regions, the highlands, the bay shore, the urban riverbanks of Camden County, and if you head to njspotlightnews.org today, Jeff Pillitz takes us to the Pinelands, where environmental stresses on this preserved land are increasingly affecting the water quality of the Delaware River and Bay region. The water in the Pinelands is some of the most, uh, still to this day, some of the cleanest in the world. It's almost as clean as uh, melted glacier water, bacterially sterile, some people have called it, and there's a lot of it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the main thing about the Pinelands water is that there is a lot, there's like 18 trillion 
gallons of water underneath the ground in this area. Increasingly, it's being drawn out for residential use, for uh, commercial use. Um, there's something like 35 billion gallons of water come out of the Pinelands Aquifer um, every, every year. And it's growing rapidly. Uh, you know, the, the water levels of the aquifer have dipped uh, in the last decade or so pretty significantly. So there are concerns that it is under threat, you know, not just from development within the pines, but from, uh, from the encroachment of water from the bay, from up the bay, in from all sides, really. You see salinity creeping into it. You see sulfur creeping into it. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Brianna Venosi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com.